Um, but if, you ha- if we haven't met, my name is Pastor Peter, and uh, I have the privilege, the honor of being the pastor here at Hope City Church, and I'd love to meet you afterwards outside on the patio or right in the lobby. Uh, we can uh, talk a little bit more and get to know uh, each other's stories. But we've been talking about in this series for the past five weeks, some of the, the big things that Jesus says, some of the, the five big topics that he's been talking about, and, and these were being, forgiving, serving, giving, and going. Or, and, and you know what? Today, we're going to be talking about this last one, this idea of, of going and telling, or maybe we would say walking and talking. And so talking isn't really a big deal to me, as you can probably imagine, right? Like this is what I do. And so, uh, you know, some of you though, I know that you don't really like to talk and you would say, I could never do what you do. Like you tell me this all the time, like I could never do that. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure you can, actually, because I'll sit there across the table from you, uh, whether we're having coffee or we're just hanging out or something along the lines of, of that, and you start telling me all about your dog, right? Like, you will go on for hours about how great Smooshy is, and, and you just love this dog so much, and, and, and you think I'm weird because I'm not interested in your dog after two and a half hours of hearing about that dog, right? Uh, or another one that you could do, another thing that we talk about is the ha- eating habits of your two-year-old, right? Some of you want to tell us all about how your, your two-year-old doesn't love spinach or peas, and they, they smash it all over their face, and you just keep going on and on and on about that, and how much they love applesauce though. And it's the greatest thing. And if I mix spinach with applesauce, then they'll eat it. And the rest of us are like, great, right? That's awesome. Or maybe you'll talk talk about your your favorite restaurant. Earlier this week, I talked to, I I asked a couple people or asked the entire world essentially on Facebook, hey, what's the greatest Mexican restaurant in Sarasota? And it was unbelievable how many responses people gave. They were this and that and, and this. And, and it was like they were passionate about it, too. Like there were people saying, how could you possibly think that? Well, I don't know. And then they going back and forth, back and forth over food, right? Well, we're going to settle it today because the Gueskis figured it out. We, we know undoubtedly that the greatest Mexican restaurant here in Sarasota is... Wicked Cantina. Okay, so just settle that, and uh, we will we'll continue on in today's service. And if you've got a bone to pick, uh, we can do that after after service. Um, but you can treat me to your favorite restaurant, and then we'll figure it out. So, but why do we do this, right? Like at the core of these things, why do we talk about these things? Why do we get so passionate about? like Wicked Cantina. Some of you right now can't even listen to me because you're frustrated by the fact that I chose Wicked Cantina. It's true. We do this because we talk about what we love. We talk about the things that we love. You love your dog so much. Like, I'm I'm a dog guy. I'm not a dog guy. Like, at a certain point in time, I'm like, cool, let's move on. How are your kids? Right? Like, can we, or what's going on here? Like, but we talk about the things that we love. Go out in the lobby after service. Talk to Pastor Justin about the Enneagram, right? Like, you won't even get the, the first two syllables out. You'll say, any, uh, and he'll already be guessing your number and telling you why he thinks that you are that way. Why? He talks about that all the time because he loves it and he's knowledgeable about it. We talk about the things that we love and what we love, uh, we find ourselves filling our time with. And, and if you wanted to get me talking more than on a Sunday morning, talk to me about spearfishing. Ask me about spearfishing. Ask me about the water clarity. Ask me about the best places in this county to go and, and free dive. And, and ask me about cleaning fish and filleting fish and, and cooking fish. And what's the best fish to make for fish tacos and, and all of these different things. And I will go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And I won't stop because I love it. it because it's, it's what I love. It's, it's a part of me. And throughout this series, we've been talking about Jesus' conversations with other people and the things that Jesus loved, the things that Jesus would talk about. Because we've said for far too long, people have been, they've painted an image of who Christ is based upon what everybody else said about him. And yet in this series, we've been taking the red letter challenge of looking at the the words that Jesus had to say about himself or what was most important to him. And in John 10.10, he said this very, very um, key scripture here. He says that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This is very important because a lot of people gather together in churches all across the world today 
And they're doing it simply because they think that if they don't, that God will be incredibly angry with them. Or that if they don't, God's going to get back at them in some capacity. If I don't do this for God, then this is going to happen to me. No, no, no. That sounds like a lie from the devil because actually Jesus, in his own words, says that I've come that you may have life and life to the full. It's why we say here at Hope City that the church should be enjoyed, not endured. I mean, how many of us can say that we come from a background and an experience where we endured going to church? (laughs) We think this should be one of the greatest times in your entire week. It's why we do everything that we can with Hope City kids, Hope City family, with students to make it the greatest time of their week because we want them to know that, that, God being, that God in their life actually brings them to life, brings them to the fullness of life. <clears throat> Excuse me. And see, when we truly believe this, when not only when we believe that Jesus intends for you to have the greatest life that you possibly could, to experience life to the fullest, but when we believe that this is, this is not only true for us, it's hard for us not to go and tell about this. It's hard for us not to talk about the things that we love. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. He says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Essentially, what Jesus is saying is, go and tell. Go and tell. Go and tell everybody about the things that I've done because Jesus, from his plan from the very beginning, was to to heal hearts and set people free, to restore people's lives and redeem them and put them back together. He says, go and tell. And yet the weird thing is, some of us, when we find a good thing, we want to keep it to ourselves. Some of us will find a good thing and we'll say, you know what, I'm not going and telling a single soul because we find ourselves keeping from other people uh, because we don't want them to get in on the, the action, right? The other day I was in uh, Economy Bait and Tackle, way down off 41, right? And I was, I was there picking up a couple lures. I was going to be going fishing um, in the next day or two. And, and this guy walks in and all of a sudden he goes, hey, uh, Pastor Peter. And I turn around and it's a guy that I know and and he looks down at my hands at the lures that I have in my hand, and, and he kind of did one of these. Mm. And I was like, okay. And so I kind of pried into that a little bit, like, what's going on? Did I get the wrong thing? Like, I could tell that he didn't approve what I had there. And he goes, well, what are you, what are you going to fish for? I said, something with gills, okay? Like, I, wanna, I just want to feel a jerk on one end of the line. I don't really care what it is. I'm going to eat it no matter what. And he said, well, where are you going to go? I said, well, I'm just going to go out, you know, kind of by New Pass. Silence. Hmm. New Pass, huh? Okay. And I looked at him and I go, what are you not telling me? He goes, well, I caught a ton of fish the other day. And I was like, cool. Like, keep going. Like, tell me where you caught these fish. I kid you not. This guy looked at me up and down, and he's like, I go, you know I'm a pastor, right? Like, there should be some privileges here, some clergy privileges. Like, tell me your spots. And so he goes, if I tell you where I caught all these fish, and he was dead serious, you have to promise you're not going to tell another person. And I said, sure. So actually, if you go down 75, you make it. I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't even remember where it is now. But it was amazing to me that after I thought about this, especially in light of this message, I'm like, why would you not tell somebody else? Why would you watch me spend hard-earned money on lures that aren't going to work in places that you know are not going to catch fish? Why would you let me do that? And we do the very same thing. Like, it's one thing with fishing, it's another with faith. It's one thing when it just really, it's kind of kind of inconsequential, but it's another when it actually leads you to life and life to the fullest that Jesus talks about. How can we go through life? How can we responsibly walk out of this place today and look our neighbors in the eyes, look the people that we see tomorrow morning at work in the eyes, and, and just wish them well in their life and not go and tell about what's changed our life? It's, it's one of the things why Jesus talks about this so much. Because it's never meant to be a secret. Jesus is not supposed to be the best kept secret in this world. See, the greatest thing that you can do 
is you can invest your life in another person's life, in someone else. And that's why here at Hope City Church, we have made it our mission to engage the faith of every generation, to instill faith in the next generation. We want you, where you are, it doesn't matter how old you are, we have a place for you to serve and lead this next generation. That's why child dedication is such a big deal to us. That's why it makes me well up with tears and not even be able to speak. And, and, and it's a big deal because we want to go and tell because we believe that Jesus leads us to life and life to the fullest, that there's nothing better than that. And so we're going to do what? We're going to talk about what we love. Those things that we love, we're going to talk about it. And we're going to talk about the things that have changed our life. And so this morning, it's my goal, my objective is to help you talk about your faith in a way that's not weird. <laughs> Can we just acknowledge that? That there has been some people that have talked about faith in a way that makes people uncomfortable. In fact, I had somebody stop me on the way in. They had no idea what I was talking about. And they said, you know, yesterday I was kind of nailed to the wall by a certain group of people that walk from house to house and they want to spend all their time telling you about, you know, their religion. <clears throat> we don't want to do that. We, we want to talk about what we love in a way that is fruitful and not weird. And so in order to do that, I'd love for you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 4. You can click over in your YouVersion app to the events tab and you can follow along with us there as well. We do that every week for you. Or you can follow along on the screens behind me. But I want you to see what Jesus does. Jesus models this for his disciples. Before he ever says, go and tell, he actually models it for them how he, you and I should go and tell one another. And so in John chapter 4, we see an interaction between Jesus and a Samaritan woman. And Jesus came to this town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, he sat down by this well, and it was about the sixth hour. So here, here's what we see. We see that Jesus has been walking for a while. He's got his tevas on, his, his olakais. He's got something on his feet. His feet are tired. He's worn out. He comes to this well at midday, right? It's 12 noon. That's, that's when this is, and it's the hottest part of the day. And he sits down, and look at what happens next. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, right here, this is what we would think. This is when like, we're talking about evangelism, we're talking about sharing our faith, and this is the son of God, right? So this is, you gotta imagine that he's gonna come up with like something earth shattering, some great way, some four spiritual laws action. Like he's going to do something amazing. Just a second, let me pull out my track. And then like it opens up all this way. And then he starts talking about, well, let me show you about myself, right? Now, look at what Jesus says. He says to her, hey, will you give me a drink? Will you give me a drink? Notice Jesus doesn't start by saying, if you were to die tonight, why would I let you in my heaven? Right? Like, this is not what he says. He doesn't say, uh, you know, there's this really big chasm, and you're on one side, and God's on the other, and, and there's something that needs to bridge the gap, right? He doesn't do that. He says, hey, can you get me something to drink, right? And see, the first step in sharing your faith in a way that isn't weird is to ask good questions. If you're taking notes with us, that's the first thing that you want to write down is ask good questions because Jesus just started a conversation about faith in a very normal way. We're going to see as he unpacks this whole thing, he says, hey, do you have a drink? Because the very first step is just asking normal, good questions. Like saying, hey, how's your family, right? Like I haven't seen Brenda in a while. You walk out and your neighbors are there, hey, how's it going? And, and then, you, you know, how's the new baby? You start to kind of poke and, and just ask some good questions, right? Or maybe your, phone, your friend's phone just keeps going off and, and you say, man, work is really busy these days, huh? You just start asking good questions. And you see, Jesus, he loved asking questions. In fact, did you know that in the Gospels, the, the four books of the Bible that tell the story of Jesus' time here on earth, that Jesus was asked 183 questions, and do you know that he only answered three of them directly? But Jesus asked 307 questions of his own. In other words, Jesus didn't come into a, a Q&A like you and I do, where we want to sit down and, and show everybody how smart we are by answering the questions. He did more of like a Q and Q. It was a question responded with another question. And Jesus... He did this because he knew that asking good questions would move us closer to the heart of things. And, and, and relationships start to be built around good questions, and, and they start to open up. Watch what happens in verse 9 here with this, with this woman. The Samaritan woman said to him, Hey, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? 
See, for Jews, don't associate with Samaritans. It's kind of like Gators and Seminoles fans. Like, we just don't really associate with one another, right? And even though the Gators lost um, horribly, or excuse me, Seminoles lost horribly to Clemson yesterday, um, you know, we still, you, you, you Gators fans are loving that. You're still not going to hang out and be like, hey, sorry about that loss, right? It's not going to happen. And Jesus, he starts to build a bridge here. She's like, you're, I'm Samaritan. You're a Jew. We shouldn't be seen together. We shouldn't be hanging out. And Jesus answered her with this. He said, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Like, do you see what happens here? Is that Jesus starts by asking a natural, simple question. You have something to drink. And it leads to a deeper discussion. In this very simple thing, you know, you, you can do this in your relationships by saying like, hey, I haven't seen Brenda in a while. Everything okay? All right, how are things with the baby? And then you get an actual response, like something beyond, oh, she's fine. We get this actual response of like, you know, things aren't really going well. I don't, I don't actually know if I'm going to make it. I'm gonna, I feel like I'm losing my mind. And in this moment, you and I, we have every opportunity. We, have, this is, we can like pull the ripcord and the parachute implo, you know, starts to go out. And then you're like, oh, I got to go. My, the wife is calling me or uh, the kids need me. I, the, you know, Smooshy the dog needs to be let out. Like Whatever it is, I got to get out of this conversation because it's about to get real. Or you can lean in and you can drill down deeper. And this is exactly what Jesus does. He says, he starts to lean in and, and drill down deeper. See, you'll be surprised that people are far more ready uh, to go there than you realize. But the question is, are you willing to drill down deeper to what's going on in their heart? See, notice when the Samaritan woman, uh, Jesus connects a physical need, her thirst, with a spiritual reality, the living water. And that connection between the physical and the spiritual, it runs just underneath of the surface of what's happening here, of the conversation. And you need to think of it this way, that a surface symptom often reveals a deeper pain. So something that's happening on the surface often reveals something that's happening deeper inside of people. Maybe it's an offhanded comment, and you're like, man, that was kind of weird. Or maybe it's anxiety, or, or maybe it's, it's like snapping at the smallest thing in, in conversations. And if you dig a little bit deeper, you're often going to find a deeper pain that, that people are struggling with. And you'll find that right there, you find some of the most meaningful conversations that reveal the heart of the matter. And that's exactly what Jesus does. He gets after the heart. In fact, check out what happens as you skip down to verse 15. The woman said to him, sir, give me that water right? Like, give me that living water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, hey, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. <laughs> it sounds a little bit like a Jesus juke right here. Like, whoa, like, yikes. Like, Jesus went there, okay? Like, he leaned in and went there. He, he went to this place where you and I might kind of tiptoe around that. See, we live in a culture where we know that just certain things we can't talk about. Like, in polite company, what are the things that you never talk about? Politics, sex, and religion. And this morning, we're talking about them all. <laughs> like, come on. This is what Hope City is about. We're, we're here to actually go there. And Jesus goes there. He just gets after it. Because he's, he's, he is so passionate about getting towards somebody's heart to helping this woman. Jesus shows us that in order to go and tell, we also have to get real. That you and I just have to get real. We got to get to that place where we can get to the heart. That third step of relational evangelism is to, to break the ice with a good question, drill down deeper, and then get real and get to the heart of the matter. Jesus said, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands. And the man that you're with now is not even your husband. In other words, Jesus is saying, is it possible that you have a bigger problem than just being thirsty? Like you've got a hole in your bucket and you're trying to fill it with something other than water. Do you, do you remember this tiny detail about this passage? That, that they met there at 12 noon, the middle of the day, the hottest part of the day. Listen, no woman would go gather water in this culture at that time. 
It was just, it was unheard of. There would be no reason to do that. And by the way, gathering water was a social activity. You all stand around the well as you're pulling water up and filling your basins and filling your jars. And yet this woman knew that if I went during social hour, if I went during the coffee club, I would be talked about because I've had five husbands and I'm sleeping with a guy that's not even my husband. And she chose to be there at this time. And Jesus starts putting all this together and he starts going to that place because he knows that deep hurt reveals the heart. Deep hurt will always reveal the heart. And he's like, listen, I understand that we're talking about water, we're talking about uh, thirst, but there's actually a deeper issue here. Is it possible that you're trying to fill your life from the wrong well? In other words, like, could we, be, could we actually talk about this in a real way? And see, that's why you and I, we got to go there because we got to go to this place. If we ever want to help people find life and life to the fullest, we have to help them, you know, see what's going on in their, in their hearts. And, and right here, this is where you and I can have the choice to kind of back away slowly and be like, I don't know. I mean, this is too personal, right? Like, Peter, you don't even know my neighbor. That's true. But we understand humans. And we understand that we have a hard time dealing with hurts with habits, with hang-ups. And we know that, as Jesus says, he's come that we could have life and life to the fullest. And in this moment, this is when the woman at the well tries to change the subject. She, she starts throwing this question at Jesus. She lobs this one up and says, hey, I see that you're a prophet. You know that I've had five husbands. You know that the guy I'm with now is not my husband. So I see that you're a prophet. There's something special about you. So let me ask you this. Our fathers, they worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. So she starts getting all religious with Jesus. And it's like this, this kind of, this distraction, this smoke screen where she's trying to distract Jesus from that really painful place in her heart. And Jesus, being the very son of God, being the one who could have authority on all of this, he doesn't take the bait. He doesn't dive into this whole thing and go into this theological, you know, kind of diatribe about how this is really going to happen and there's the way it's all going to play out. No, no, no. He doesn't go down that road with her. He stays right there. In fact, step four of this whole thing is avoid religious debate. There are, there are many things that are good and proper to think about and that matter but when we're trying to get to the heart of people and what's going on in their life, you and I, we should avoid religious debate and get to the things that matter most. Isn't it ironic, though, that this woman is standing with the Son of God who can answer all of these things, and he deflects. He's like, yeah, can't we talk about something different? But can't we talk about this? And Jesus doesn't take the bait. In verse 21, it actually says this, that Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time's coming when we're not going to worship here or there, not on the mountain or in Jerusalem. And the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus is like, yeah, that religious debate that you're talking about, like, should we, is it okay to worship in a school or do we have to have a building? Do we, do we have to do it over here? Do we have to have four songs? Is it this? Is it that? He's like, not interested in that. We're not going to debate that. I've got something I want you to know even more than that. In fact, this is my favorite part of this whole passage because Jesus gives us our last and final step. He says, listen, I who speak to you, I'm he. Guys, Jesus doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't hold back. In fact, what he does is at the very end of this whole thing, he reveals Christ. He reveals himself. And this is what you and I need to do. I know it sounds so obvious. I know this sounds elementary. And some of you are like, this is it? Like, this is the big plan, right? But, but when you ask questions, when, when, you, when you go there, when you dig a little bit deeper, and, and you start to see where their, their hurt is and, and what's going on in their life, and, and then you stop short, it would be like that guy in the... In, in the bait shop, if he looked at me and he was like, yeah, yeah, go ahead, <laughs> head out there. And even if he told me the place, but didn't tell me how to catch the fish, it would be, it would be unheard of. I, I, would be, I would be so short from, from being able to do the very thing that I was there to do. 
See, it's not just about listening to your friends. It's not just about listening to your neighbors. It's actually about helping them, going and telling, being with them and offering something that, that can make a difference. It's like this with, you know, with that illustration of, of a neighbor and saying like, hey, you know what? I can remember when my kids were little too. In fact, Tiffany and I, we, our third child, uh, Leah, she had her days and nights mixed up. And, and I can tell you that that is one of the most crazy times of life that I, I don't know that I could even think straight. You know, we were, it was, we were sleeping literally on different schedules. So yeah, I get it. I get that life is crazy. But do you know what? And, and this is where you get the opportunity to reveal Christ in a normal, natural way. Do you know what kept me sane? My church and, and my, my group of friends and quite honestly, my relationship with Jesus. Because that was the only way that I knew how to continue to love my wife, to love my kids and, and to serve my family. And you begin to unpack things and just reveal Christ. And we point to Jesus. Because after all, what does Jesus say? He says that I've come that they may have life and life to the fullest. We believe that to be true. We know this to be true from our own lives. Why wouldn't we tell other people about this kind of life? Holding on to your favorite fishing spot? Okay. But keeping your faith and what you know to be true and helping other people? I do not understand that. In fact, the, the group Penn and Teller, Penn from that, that group, he said, uh, who, he's a known um, atheist, he's a self-proclaimed atheist. He has said, and he's quoted in saying that, how much do you have to hate a person to not share your faith with them if you really believe that it changes the world? How much do you have to hate them? Especially if you believe it could change their life. See, it all starts with good questions of being real and revealing Jesus. This is why Jesus says, go and tell. And so let me ask you this morning, what's your name? On the bottom of your, your notes here, uh, as you've been following along, tracking there, I'm interested not in what your name is. Obviously, we want to know you. But I'm pretty sure that you know your own name. But I want you to think, what is the name of the person that as I've been thinking, as I've been talking, you're thinking, man, that's the person that I probably need to ask a little bit better questions of, or I need to drill down a little deeper, or I need to eventually, you know, get to the place where I can reveal Christ to them. I want you to, to write that name down on your notes. And then what I want you to do is I want you to, to, to take this and just fold this in half right there. There's a perforated tab there. Tear that off. And I want you to keep that in a place that's going to remind you. That's going to remind you that the best secret that you have, the best, the greatest thing that's ever happened in your life is not meant for you to be keeping that from people but to be revealing that to the world around you. See, for this past week, as I've been thinking and praying about this, I've been praying for you that God would, would open up doors of opportunity for you, that he would have divine appointments just like the one that Jesus had with this woman at the well. You know, that maybe as you're at five guys later today, that you start to talk and you start to have conversations that you can reveal Christ. Or maybe you're, you're over at, at University Town Center Mall or you're, you're shopping at Target or all of these normal, natural places where you engage with people. Let's not keep the greatest thing that we have from everyone else. See, we've learned throughout this entire series, we've discovered what God has in store for your life and for mine. We can't. We cannot keep this from people. We need to go and tell. And in doing that, we will honor God and see him change the world around us.